everyone, welcome back to episode six of Demand Decoded. Episode six already, blimey. This slide event series decodes the secrets of successful B2B marketing, and we're Blend, a B2B website and demand generation agency. Thanks for joining us for episode six. We appreciate you, you taking the time to watch and listen, whether that's live or on a podcast or YouTube. Just thanks for being here, really, and listening to us and learning. Um, I'm with Phil, as usual, today. And we'll be diving into the evolution of buyer preferences and how you can adapt your marketing to serve these changes. And hopefully, by the end of this episode, you'll understand how buyer pre uh, preferences have actually changed, understand what's caused those changes, so you can kind of understand the nuances that go behind buyer thoughts and that kind of thing. And you'll know how to adapt your strategy to better resonate with today's buyers. And as usual, feel free to uh, pop any questions in the comments on LinkedIn, and then we can bring them up as we go along live. It's great to get a few to, you know, kind of give you any individual insight that you need and, um, yeah, just spark some conversation. So feel free if you have any questions, pop them in. So I think, you know, obviously the first thing that we should talk about is how buyer behavior has actually changed. And I think, you know, a good way to look at this is to go, as far back as you know reasonable and to really look at the buyer evolution and the evolution of knowledge actually because before you know the internet and the digital age there was a huge knowledge shift so you know before the times of websites all of the knowledge for you know products and services and solutions were with vendors so it was only natural for buyers to have to reach out to vendors quite early in the process to understand and learn and educate themselves on, you know, what might be the best thing for them, the best product, the best solution for them. And they would have to trust whatever that vendor was telling them at that point in time, because there were no better sources of information out there. It was merely just what that salesperson was telling you or, you know, that that advice that you were getting from that vendor whereas you know you look from 2000 and beyond probably um in the digital buying era and information is everywhere especially from you know 2010 onwards really um you know when blogging and other types of content marketing really became popular that information is so widespread now that actually you know looking at the knowledge transfer the knowledge is just with buyers now you know they have more knowledge than anyone because they have so much access to content and information it's it's unbelievable really that's right and as a result of the ongoing shift of that availability of knowledge and the sort of willingness of buyers to engage with the sales part of your business at different stages in the process you know, we've arrived at a point where the behaviour of a, of a buyer is very different from how it was uh, and, it, and is continually shifting increasingly towards these modes where really we see them, yeah, holding on to control of the process, something marketers have talked about for a long time, but they really are exercising this ability now. And it's produced a set of buyer behaviours that if you're not, aware of and, and alert to and, and responding to, then you're increasingly going to be marketing to anybody but your buyer <laughs> uh, and, and generating a lot of a lot of leads that won't come on to close and so on. And, you know, for reasons that are connected to what you just described and that we'll go into in a moment, you know, the, the situation today is that buyers are, you know, as reported, not just by us, but by Gartner and others, you know, they're doing much more of the purchase process independently meaning they're sourcing and consuming information anonymously, privately, without giving up their details, without entering the lead pool, without converting to download stuff that they know they can get elsewhere freely. Um, they're acting in a very unpredictable, non-linear manner. Um, so, you know, you can't build a, a model of the funnel, as it were, and expect each and every buyer that eventually does buy to follow the steps as you as you precisely describe them it doesn't happen in that linear direction they're doing different parts of the research process at a completely unpredictable rate going backwards and forwards in ways you would never have expected 
um, and, and not at all in a linear fashion. They've got more ways and places to find and discover and consume information than ever before, and they use them. And that's part of the what I think is a symbiotic relationship between the landscape the buyers are in and the buyer behaviours, which tend to push one another along to a degree. We might talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment, but you know they are not just talking to salespeople or downloading ebooks and white papers or receiving newsletters there are far more ways and places to uh, to find them and reach them and um, as i said you know privacy is a concern for everybody and at the same time they know what the impact of giving that up is and we'll talk about that in a moment um, and then you know finally sales sales people sales processes are still very important but they are reserved now for the very last part of the purchase process because you know they have been to a certain degree over many years burned let's let's face it by what salespeople and advertisers say which is not always in their best interests completely impartial or truthful now i know that everybody watching is always impartial truthful and acts in their buyer's best interests but on mass buyers experience of marketing advertising and sales is not necessarily that uh, so it has meant that they've shifted away from trusting and, and engaging with them earlier. Um, yeah, I, th- I think a lot goes into that, you know, actually, that like you kind of just described, the content consumption evolution as well. It's like buyers don't rely on vendors for information anymore. So actually having to reach out to them to find find out something, they don't really need to do it because they can just find it somewhere else, whether that's on you know that particular company's website or just a quick google search or you know in any other place where they consume content they can just find that information out so yeah buyers are just avoiding talking to sales because they don't want to be sold to until the moment where they want to be sold to which is the last possible and that's a product i think of this cycle which is you know buyers demonstrate a behavior which is the product of some set of influences and stimuluses they receive and then technology adapts to sort of facilitate that behavior then we try to monetize and saturate that new technology and behavior moves on again so you know the fact that you know buyers are now seeking content outside of the conversation with sales is the product of experiences they've had and it's now enabled by technology and for a while there we adopted a kind of halfway house where you know very common to gate the content you know get the contact details which is still kind of holding on to that information to a degree um and it worked for a while perhaps uh, you know but buyer behavior moved on again which is to say that they're, they're not willing as they were once to give up their contact details although it's not equivalent to talking to sales it's entering your sort of in your, it's becoming known to you and that's a risk they're no longer prepared to take until they're absolutely sure that you know you or a small number of businesses like you are going to get their purchase at the end of the day and that's when they'll reveal themselves yeah and i to be honest i think that is quite well known now like people understand that buyer behavior has changed it's well documented like you said by Gartner, by huge companies, really, you know, in in surveys and customer research and, you know, people talking to their own customers and understanding how they buy. But I actually think understanding why that has happened and why those individual changes we just spoke about actually came about really gives you insight into what you should be doing now as well, because you understand why that shift has happened and yeah. you kind of get in the mind of these buyers a bit. Yeah, well, it's all it's all the product of experience, right? And you know, one of the big one of the bigger, more recent changes in buyer behaviour is this reluctance to convert, right? Reluctance to download or, or convert on a form, for example, to download content. And for a brief moment, filling in a form to download a piece of content was a way to gain access to really useful information that wasn't available elsewhere, but 
you know, nowadays, we all know that that's very often not the case. What you download as a result of filling in a form and giving up your privacy and your contact details, you know, most often isn't groundbreaking. Most often isn't deeper or more actionable or more, um, you know, impartial than anything you can find online. So it's become an unrewarding experience for buyers to fill in that form to get that ebook because what they get isn't all that great. Now, there are people out there who've always written content that goes above and beyond the norm and the average, um, but too often the result was lacklustre. And so buyer behavior shifted away from that. You know, so one of the main reasons that we're seeing that happen is because over a long period of time, the content that people experienced as a result wasn't offering them the value that it, it should or it could or it once did. So, you know, it's driving the shift away from doing it. Not to, you know, and that's even before we get onto the subject of what happens after. Because, of course, the notion is that we convert someone into a contact using content so that we can very respectfully, very helpfully cajole them along the sales process yeah. somehow, the purchase process, you know, yeah. send them uh, more content that's relative to their very predictable place in the purchase journey, you know, which is, as we've discussed, no longer really uh, possible if it ever was. Um, and, and, and basically, buyers know that now if they do convert on a form, in order to receive a piece of content or something like it, they are going to get email spam, which is basically the best thing you can really call nurturing emails these days, let's face yeah, it. I was going to say, is that a reference to uh, nurturing emails here or actual yeah. spam? But, you know, are they the same thing? I think once a, once a channel like email becomes saturated, automated and optimized, you know, you, it, it, it loses its cutting edge efficacy right so nurturing email most of it goes unread most of it's filtered out by technology most of it's deleted so we resort then to the in mails you know we go we go to the source as it were but nobody wants to receive those truth be told you know the, the hit rate on those has got to be absolutely infinitesimal um so then we hit the phones and we call the people that downloaded the content you know either we got their phone number if we were you know that way inclined or, or we source it from some other party and we call them Buyers want none of those things until they're ready. So yet again, there's another driving force behind them not converting, not entering the lead pool and staying anonymous and only consuming content that's freely publicly available until the purchase decision is, you know, as near as done. So this is a very significant and um, irreversible set of drivers that are changing buyer behavior into what we see today. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at that, the process that they go on, the access to more information means that buyers don't have to follow a, a linear process. They're not downloading your piece of content and waiting for your five step email nurture sequence to learn about your product. If they want to learn, they'll go onto your website and have a look, like explore in their own ways or ask their peers or consume the information in whatever way is preferable to them yeah they're not going to wait 14 days to receive five emails and consume them all in perfect order um the process just doesn't work like that because people operate in different ways we're not robots we're human yeah and the you know they're never disconnected from the vast array of stimulus and ideas that are being presented all the time right people don't sit down to solve one problem and turn off everything else that's going on so it's not like yeah. work happens in a linear form most of the time anymore so uh, neither does problem solving and the purchase decision it, it's really you know it, it can be quite stop start for buyers you know they're not focused on it exclusively um a new potential solution or opportunity can present itself at any time during the process take them right back to the beginning you know and and everybody that they want to engage with will have a different process and methodology for it so lots of very very um uh, different paths to go along go on as as they try and make a, a purchase decision so yeah really highly highly non-linear anymore yeah and you know, as we kind of alluded to at the start, 
buyers consume content in many different ways now. And this is one I think we we spent a long time kind of discussing um, recently, uh, which is kind of, you know, the content consumption evolution and trying to kind of understand why this has happened. And I think really it's just like because there are more ways to access content and hang out in those places and you know the the evolution of kind of apps like tiktok and things like that that allow you to consume content so easily and it's readily available just makes it yeah easy but again there's there's, there's a connection between sort of technology and the human psyche i suppose you know humans are, are social animals and of course social platforms like linkedin and facebook and tiktok you know satisfy a need for humans we're probably straying too far into psychology but you know ultimately people spend time there there's no there's not necessarily any really great reason for them to do so <laughs> other yeah. than they want to they like to but what's gone on what's happened is those are now those are now the uh, you know the water holes where you can find people convening and you can have conversations that stimulate ideas and create great things which is a perfect place to essentially create demand for something um the risk to those things is is how how much and how hard they get monetized right if a mm. platform or a channel like that is i guess over leveraged by its owner then the, you, you're suddenly past the prime of it as a place where you can, by doing good work, by creating good things, be they content or messages or experiences, you can have a you can generate a good reaction. We we always have to be wary, and I think several platforms have seen the effect of that take away some of their efficacy. Um, but for the time being, those are places where yeah, your buyers are hanging out, spending time voluntarily, and you can if you're careful, become part of their consciousness and discussion without being, you know, overly salesy, which is a big a big push off for them now because they're so reluctant to be sold to, as we've discussed. Yeah. And, you know, as part of that content consumption evolution, it's just so easy to consume content now, you know, like you well, kind yeah. of before, you know, we are social animals and we just go on these apps because we want to. And, you know, as as businesses, if we are there in these places at the right time, producing valuable content that people want to consume, they will consume it. Yeah. And in the format that can be that's a, that's optimized for the for the place, you know, so the you know, putting a link to your blog post isn't going to work terribly well on a platform like like LinkedIn, but creating a snapshot of the key takeaway, a carousel or, or an infographic, a short video that can be played natively, all those things are great way to great ways to make yourself known and understood by your community of buyers. Again, whilst they're part of that vast majority of your addressable market that are not in purchase mode, which is where you go and how you go about creating demand in the first place. Yeah. And, you know, just carrying on the, the content evolution, the the kind of bar that's been set now to actually create content and publish it has gone up so many levels since, you know, social media was first a thing that buyers just sit in these places and consume content because the amount of value that you get just scrolling through your LinkedIn feed is unbelievable. You know, you don't have to go to you know, website forward slash blog or subscribe to a newsletter now to be able to get any kind of, you know, long form value, you can, you know, literally just scroll through YouTube or, you know, listen to a podcast or your social feed or, you know, there are so many ways now to consume brilliant content because the bar has been set so high that people are just raising it and raising it. And, buyers can then just consume all of that great content and you know ultimately that's why it, it's evolved so so massively yeah i think there's a there are phases of a purchase you know and then the early phase is really you know 
a non-purchase part of the process, but ultimately it's about being open to and exposed to lots of potential solutions to your problems, you know, lots of ways to generate additional pipeline, lots of ways to attract buyers, lots of ways to solve all your problems. And, and social is a great place to see a lot of those things in a very digestible format. Now, when it gets down to like really researching whether one or more of them are going to solve your problem the way you need and want, that's when the website and more, shall we say, traditional forms of content probably have an increased value. Um, and then they, and then eventually they will move on to contacting your or entering your sales process uh, as mm -hmm. a result of having reassured themselves that what you offer is close, if not, you know, perfect match for what they need. So as we go through that purchase process, you know, you find that different types of content play a different role, don't they? Exactly. So what about privacy? Obviously, you know, you said before privacy um, is on buyers' minds more than ever. and they value it more than ever, but I suppose, you know, what are the, the reasons why it's led to be that way? Well, I think that's a two-sided um, thing. One is simply the, you know, awareness we all have around the, um, uh, the vulnerability that our private data is under when we hand it over willingly to companies who through no fault of their own are, you know, probably incapable of protecting it against all threats. You know, breaches are everywhere. And, you know, it just as often it's very big companies who have immensely sophisticated cybersecurity, uh, you know, measures in place as well. It's not, it typically isn't small companies that you hear about as much, but ultimately data isn't safe when you give it away, when it's on servers yeah. over here and in systems over there so there's a i think everybody subconsciously or consciously has a privacy concern right now because of course personal data being stolen can potentially lead to you know increasingly serious consequences yeah. if your identity is stolen you know then that can really really cause trouble and harm you so everyone's thinking in a in a in a in a way that i think is conscious of the privacy risks and then to add to that there's this fact that if a buyer gives away their privacy to you know 10 or 20 vendors as they're going through the early research phase they just know what's going to happen they know their inbox is going to be flooded with automated and occasionally the odd manual email yeah. their linkedin inbox is going to fill up you know the, the contact requests are going to come and quickly be followed up with the you know let's talk about the solution and you know more often than not the phone will start ringing and you know we know we have known for a long time that buyers are not receptive to those types of um, outreach the conversion rate from them is in the low single decimal place digits you know i think the last report i read was it was less than zero point less than zero point one percent or something ridiculous you know so you're having to make thousands of connections thousands to get through once mm. it's a pretty clear indicator that buyers are not relishing that method so yeah i think for those two reasons giving up contact details is less you know much much less uh, freely done by the buyers as they're going through through the process yeah for those two reasons how do you think the kind of like publicity of um, data breaches and, you know, that kind of thing is affecting buyers being aware of their privacy? Because I, I think it's definitely had an impact. You know, there's people, you know, that I know that would have never, ever thought about how their data is being accessed by multiple companies in, in ways like never before. And all of a sudden, you know, because it's on the news every now and again now about these huge data breaches, mm. buyers are just so much more aware that this stuff is happening. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's vitally important that they are aware because if you think how sort of freely we've been distributing bits of our personal information and our identity, it's quite scary, really. Um, now, don't get me wrong, buyers and people in general will still continue to do things at a high volume take you know accepting cookies on websites mm. how many of us just instantly click accept all 
despite the fact that that banner has been put there in an effort to give us control over our privacy. So it doesn't bring about an overnight end to the behavior. Um, but, you know, speaking as a you know citizen of the world and somebody who's, you know, as vulnerable to this as anybody else, I, you know, I think it's important that data breaches are made public and people are aware. And I think it's important that people, everybody looks after their digital privacy. And therefore, I think it's great that buyers do. And I think it's necessary for us to adapt and align to that. Um, and that's just the way it's going to be going forward, um, unless there are major changes in the way that privacy is secured by companies. But I haven't seen anything lately that suggests it will be. No. Okay. So after all of those, you know, um, the evolution of buyer preferences, what are, you know, now some of the ways that you can adapt your strategy to better resonate with today's buyers? So if you stop for a moment and you think about what your buyers like and dislike and you analyse what actually goes on before somebody becomes a customer, then you can get a pretty clear indication of how to align the marketing you do to the journey they want to take. And you know the journey they don't want to take is pretty clear. They don't want to fill in a form to download an ebook, to receive three automated emails, to be scored and then phone called. What they do want to do is have access to the information that they need to make a decision freely, publicly, not be you know coerced into converting and becoming a lead and, and downloading it. Um, and and everybody's looking for everybody's looking to build affinity with um, other another party. You know, so by giving your buyer this content, this knowledge, the, what you know freely, and um, publishing it you know in an ungated format on your website so that it can be found so that it can then also be repurposed and atomized and made packaged for the other places that they go to consume content and research um you can help them build affinity with you over and above any other brands that they don't get the same value from or don't experience at all as they go through the process and you can get them to the point where they're willing to spend some time potentially on your website really researching whether the product service or solution you offer meets some or all of the requirements they have and then you can get them to the point where potentially they will take an action that you offer them on your website to indicate their interest to reveal themselves to you in a way that correlates you know with a degree of qualification and they can buy they're likely to buy they have a high intent to purchase something and you know they're prepared to give you their their identity please look after it and time to either talk to your sales team go through a demo process trial the software you know but ultimately hopefully enter the pipeline and become a customer yeah I think you know, through all of the changes we've just spoken about, actually the one thing that we're telling people to stop doing is stop putting leads, like stop trying to capture details too early before a buyer is ready to give it to you. That's the main you know, strategy change that you have to do here. Yeah. Let buyers be anonymous for as long as they want to be. You know, let them keep their privacy and stay in control of the journey like they want to be up until the exact point they're ready to talk to you and hand over those details. So, I mean, yeah, really the strategy is the strategy changes. Stop creating leads too early. Stop, you know, stop trying to manipulate buyers into giving over their details before they're ready to do so. So you can try and market to them and sell to them when they don't want to be marketed to and sold to and start focusing on creating high intent opportunities that is well high intent conversions basically when a buyer is saying hi can i talk to you because if you optimize around that if everything you're doing is focused on that thing then everything you do before that to get a buyer to that point 
is probably going to align with these changes in preferences. Yeah, absolutely. If you optimize for the things that produce high intent conversions, you know, qualified, interested buyers willingly entering the sales process and not for creating leads, then you're going to be aligning to the buyer's preferences for the process. And I think, you know, as well, if you've written or have the ability to write a piece of content, which is genuinely good enough to help a buyer make an informed decision, then you absolutely have to publish it, you know, uh, openly because buyers won't take the risk of downloading it. So they'll never see it if it is good enough. And you need the world to know that you are writing that that content that is good enough. If you're one of the you know, thousands of uh, businesses that are ultimately trying to, I suppose, maximize, optimize that channel, shortcut the process, you know, really rush out content that isn't great, isn't, isn't actionable, isn't valuable, and put it behind a gate so that you can generate a lead. You know, buyers are savvy to that now. They're, they're savvy to it, and they're not going to allow it to happen to them. So you've got to get it out there and show it to, to the world. And then when you do, I mean, the the results, the benefits are, you know, they're kind of self-fulfilling in, in an essence. It's out there. People can see it. People can see that you mean well. You're doing good work. You're credible. And that will re you'll reap the rewards of that. Yeah. And, you know, I think in terms of adapting your strategy, you know, it's absolutely crucial to understand how your buyers want to consume content and learn and gather information about, you know, what they're trying to achieve. And you have to be producing content in those formats, in those ways. It, it's no good just kind of guessing and maybe, you know, picking up the latest trend that that's happening, because if that doesn't relate to your buyer, then it's no good really doing it. You know, you have to do the things that they want you to do and yeah. do more of them. You know, if, yeah. if it's working, don't stop. Don't, you know, pick up the latest thing. If you're blogging and your blogging is, you know, converting highly and, you know, buyers are finding that content useful, don't then, you know, start another tactic or in another channel, you know, maximize where you are and what's working before you move on to the next thing yeah i mean it it can be challenging and we've seen this in communities that we're part of and you know relationships that we've had at the agency and all sorts of uh, different places but it can, it can be hard for marketers to sort of accept some of these more fundamental changes necessary um you know it can, it can take a long time to bring people around to the idea that actually what they've been told to do or what they've you know learned to do is no longer the way sometimes it's very quick but in some in some situations it, it, it's a very slow process it takes a long time um, but I, I do think I do I do wish marketers would spend more time you know introspectively looking looking at themselves in in the in the sort of metaphorical mirror and saying well what is it that I as a buyer respond to and yeah. what is it that I, as a buyer, avoid, you know, dislike, you know, and and how and how much is that reflected in the marketing I'm doing to my business's buyer? Because I find it really interesting that we all have largely similar preferences for how we engage with content and with companies. But when we come into work and sit down at our desk as a marketer, we put all of that aside. And yeah, you know, it is bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, and, it's so true spend, then a mass of time and money trying to optimize a channel that we know in the back of our mind is completely ineffective at turning us into customers of organizations. So, yeah, you know, I, I do, uh, I do encourage people to stop and think about themselves as a, usually as a pretty good example of what their buyer will like and dislike. Yeah. Or at least there, there is likely to be, you know, a particular subject matter expert that's been in your industry for, you know, donkey's years or you know maybe quite new but you know somebody who's more in the industry I'm just thinking you know back to past roles where I wasn't necessarily the subject matter expert um, but there were people there that understood buyers very well and you know them themselves had been a buyer in those positions so you know there, there's likely to be people around you that you can ask and understand those preferences for yeah if you if you are you know 
smart enough to know that you can't necessarily trust your own, uh, you know, your own take on something like that, then you could, then you can definitely sp speak to others and get insights, right? Speaking to customers, of course, is a perfectly valid way to gather, you know, insight into what they like. Got to be careful with how you structure the questions because, you know, there's always, there's always degrees of bias that come into conversations like that, like, you know, what do you like and dislike about our marketing? But you're, you're the person doing it, asking. So you've got to be careful to avoid, uh, you know, bias in the answers. Um, but, you know, another topic we've talked on, self-reported attribution, you know, so often tells you that the true source of interest in what you offer is not what you, you know, expected. It's not what you necessarily thought you were, uh, you know, optimising for. Um, so you can use a variety of methods and and ways to gain the insight that will reassure you that shifting away from the you know the older buyer journey model to the newer independent private anonymous you know method that we're talking about is the right way to go and um, there should be plenty of evidence for that around in your data in your conversations that you can have with your audience with your customer in communities that you're a part of um, and and again, just in your own mind, in terms of what works for you. Yeah, and I mean, even you know, outside of those conversations and your own thoughts, there is published information on this by the likes of Gartner, who have a huge wealth of data on buyer behaviour. That you know, okay, take some of the stuff with a pinch of salt, but for the most part the trends are all heading in the same direction, right? The changes are all published the same. So yeah. Yeah. have a look at them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there, is off, there are sometimes, you know, inertia factors. You know, you've, you might have to change how your sales team, you know, thinks about leads versus, you know, qualified leads and so on. You might, you might have to change how they're focused. You might have to change... What you measure, you might have to win over, you know, the hearts and minds of, of others. So there are there are things that create inertia in adopting this change. But, yeah, largely speaking, it's widely spoken about, um, lots of evidence for it. And if you can overcome that inertia, then you have an opportunity to you know, really future-proof your marketing and grow better, if not faster, as a result. Yeah. I mean, I think we should just, you know, dive in slightly deeper, actually, to some of the potential challenges that you might face when, you know, adapting to these modern buyer preferences, because you're going to have to change quite a lot of, you know, your marketing tactics and strategies and sales and you know business strategies at times to actually, you know, pivot towards these buyer changes, um, uh, buyer preference changes. So, yeah, it's really important to understand some of the challenges you're going to face along the way. You can't just, you know, suddenly take all of your gated content and ungate it um, and, you know, stop producing leads and that kind of thing. Right. Like, yeah, I do. You would, right? I do. Yeah, but that will be the biggest change for, for mature companies that have established, you know, ways of working. One of the most common barriers or to overcome is that you're talking about uh, a change in your marketing strategy that will produce a sudden drop, significant drop in number of leads generated. And for lots of organizations, by proxy, number of MQLs artificially brought about by scoring. <laughs> you know, so you are potentially saying to your organization, we're going to generate a, a lot less leads and a lot less MQLs. And but we're going to generate a higher quality and a higher quantity of, you know, a higher quality quantity of high intent leads, but a much lower quantity overall. And yeah. of course, that that can bring about a question. Well, what will all of our SDRs do with their time if they're not being supplied with 50 fresh leads a day to call and email and sequence? What are they going to do? And that's probably for for organizations that are in that situation that's probably the the bigger challenge or the bigger factor they've got to overcome uh, but as we discussed last time you know there are organizations that have 
paved the way for us. They've overcome it. They've found ways to refocus the time and effort of their SDRs away from the leads that they used to receive and call um, and, you know, get everybody excited about the opportunity that only talking to people who want to talk to you presents in terms of sales velocity, um, average customer value, and just close rate, you know, which will be far, far higher from that smaller pool of truly interested buyers as opposed to the very large pool of relatively disinterested leads that you used to call. Yeah, absolutely. And aside from, you know, some of the larger changes that you have to make as part of your organization, you know, the whole mind shift and, you know, metrics and potential, you know, sales structure shift. I actually, you know, thinking back to, I think it was actually episode one, um, gated versus ungated content. And somebody asked us, um, well, if I'm not gating my content, then how do I follow up with these people? Mm. Like there's there's a mental shift that marketers have to make here. That's it's strange. It's like, oh, like I'm not gating it. Like, yeah. well, how do I measure anything then? Like, what what do I do? It's like, you know, us as marketers actually have to take this leap of faith and you know almost embrace these changes. Um, and that that's quite a mental shift sometimes. The, the path to success as an organization isn't always the same path that can be measured precisely at every step along the way, you know, and that's quite hard because businesses, you know, are, you know thrive on measurability and performance metrics and, and feedback. But, you know, there are, so, there are often counterintuitive things that create success. Um, and that's a struggle for marketers because we've been conditioned to, to measure and optimize pretty much everything we do you know, uh, over the recent, over recent years, but ultimately, you know, organizations should be aligned around, well, aligned around growth and revenue, things that produce revenue, ultimately. Organizing and aligning sales around one metric and marketing around another metric that, uh, that are either one or the other, not that, is potentially counterproductive in the long run because you're getting a team, your marketing team, to optimize all of their effort around something which doesn't necessarily correlate with the true thing that matters and the true thing that creates successful customers and the organization, which is you know growth. So you are going to see, if you adopt a strategy that's aligned to modern buyer preferences, a shift in the things that you can measure and that you should measure. Um, and we would advise that you look down the funnel, you look at high intent leads, which we call MQLs, just not the scored version. Yeah. Um, opportunities created and you know customers closed and the other and the things beyond that point. And use marketing metrics to inform your uh, you know your process, your creative process to a degree to, in terms of what's resonating, what's working, what's creating engagement, but not use marketing metrics as a measure of success because, a measure of success in a marketing sense is probably, you know, at at odds with a measure of success in terms of sales and revenue. Yeah. And, you know, just kind of looking at a more granular tactical level, you know, when you're trying to pivot your strategy towards changing buy preferences, it will ultimately lead you to do new and different things and adopt new strategies and new tactics and try out new channels and, and those kind of things. And, you know, the one thing I would just say is you don't have to perfect those things straight away. Um, it's better to get started and learn as you go um, and then, you know, evolve and improve and iterate over time. But actually just getting started, you know, whether if you're gating content at the moment, ungate it, you know, put it in a pillar page and, you know, see how then that affects your SEO over time. If, if you're not really active on LinkedIn, start posting on LinkedIn, you know, like one to three times a week. It doesn't have to be, you know, super duper branded, amazing looking creative. If the content resonates with your buyer and helps them and is informative, they're probably going to like it and engage with it over time. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd say there's a there's a guiding principle that I use and I encourage, which is to 
wherever you're looking at the, the customer journey at any point in time in your marketing you know estate optimize the place you're in for the buyer you know, at the stage they're at um let me rephrase that because i didn't congress totally clearly <laughs> the customer journey is kind of a continuum it's not a linear continuum but it ultimately is a continuum and if you optimize content and the way you present it for the buyer in each instance you can create the best customer journey possible so for example you've got a potential buyer on your blog reading a blog post somehow you know happy day don't go and clutter that blog with calls to action left right and center social sharing buttons here subscribe pop-ups over there you know author tags archives profiles you know don't do that stuff optimize for what the buyer is trying to do trying to accomplish at that moment which is read the content move on to your website which is usually going to be visited at a later stage in the buying in the purchase process your home page your product your services pages optimize the user experience the navigation the layout for the buyer at that point in time you know don't have whizzy sliders flying by don't go bananas with motion and animation if it doesn't help you get your message across you know don't put a burger navigation on your desktop website that actually impairs navigation and travel optimize for the buyer there optimize for the buyer on your pillar pages on your blog posts and optimize for the buyer on social and you can remove a lot of the friction from the path to raising their hand and telling you they're interested yeah just hearing the word slider and desktop burger menu is making me want to end this you know right now just because it sends shivers up my spine yeah it's Horrendous. fascinating it's handy actually that next week's episode is on um website ux isn't it so i'm sure yeah. i'm sure you'll dive into it more then but yeah yeah well, well whatever you're looking at, at any on at any particular time you should be putting the buyer's needs and preferences first not your own um and making things easier for them you know in the mode they're in which is to say a buyer is probably not on your website in that information gathering, idea gathering mode. So presenting information or, or, or designs that are aligned to that is quite often counterproductive to what, what they need and therefore what you're trying to achieve. So it's quite a simple guiding principle, as I've said, which if applied can actually make you know it, it, the journey very painless and very effective at getting people to willingly you know take that final all important step which is to you know book that call with you if, if that's what you're offering yeah okay so on that point then after somebody books that call with you or fills out that high intent form whatever it may look like um whether it's book a demo free trial um book a consultation get in touch whatever it may be what are the kind of buyer preferences beyond the creation and capturing of that demand like you know the kind of experience i suppose past marketing almost well i mean there's a lot of there's probably a lot of variety in what works um in different businesses and uh, for different products and offer solutions there but probably some holistic principles are that buyers desire responsivity quick you know ultimately everybody's time poor information rich if you get an inquiry from a buyer then your ability to respond to it appropriately quickly is you know well known to correlate with success further on and also you know continuing the principle of removing friction from that process making it easy to do what's required not anything else you know mm. trying to get buyers to do something else very easy that isn't aligned to their wish at that point in time is 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 foolish but you know, making sure that your systems, your technology, your platform, you know, is able to facilitate, uh, you know, quick, quick response, quick follow up when it's needed. Uh, you know, a simple process to take the next step, which is, you know, be a, a handover to a, an actual named sales rep who can reach out and can have the conversation. You know, people increasingly don't really want to be bank qualified on a first call so I, I i say can have the conversation meaning you know somebody with the knowledge that's that's necessary or for example if it's a demo you know i love solutions that facilitate somebody joining a demo 
instantaneously when they're ready because mm -hmm. this idea that you will fill in a form to schedule a demo for some time in the future quite often a bit you know doesn't go over terribly well with buyers whereas if you can make that demo immediately available but it still have the qualities that a demo should have um that's really powerful so remove friction uh you know create speed and keep it simple you know an overly complicated sales process doesn't help anybody um you know although the temptation with modern software is always to make things more and more complicated but it's usually advisable to go in the other direction yeah and i think we've spoken about it before you know don't give in always to the temptation of shiny software like chatbots um meeting schedulers things like that because sometimes they can just impair the buyer experience um but also you know sometimes the the selling experience too they can have the opposite effect to the one you want them to have which is you know ultimately you know they can quite often increase quantity but decrease quality you know taking away structure from the purchase process as i said you know making the things that are necessary or desired by the buyer easy but not the, not other things this this is usually advisable so yeah by all means test you know that i'm i'm all for experimentation um but when something doesn't work please don't be reluctant to turn it off just because you know it's exciting shiny or new right trust the data lean into what works push it open doors um and you'll 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 create greater results more quickly yeah cool well i think on that note um we should probably wrap up episode six all right so, so yeah i mean if you found if you found this useful as usual you know we'd love to hear your feedback uh be sure to follow the blend linkedin page for all the future events Next week's is coming up and is on uh, killer website UX tips, which I'm taking a back seat on for this one because, you know, I, I'm not the expert here on website UX. I'm leaving that with Phil and uh, Jasmine at Blend. So, yeah, be sure to tune in for that. I certainly will. So I can't wait for that one. And you can watch any previous episode on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, basically any kind of place where you would ever continued content just search for demand decode and you will probably find it there so yeah thanks for tuning in and we will see you next week bye bye, bye everyone.